Kahiso Trust in partnership with the University of Zululand welcome you to the inaugural webinar of the Bears No Deer Memorial Lecture, a capacity building platform that tackles leadership issues. Kahiso Trust has been hosting the Bears No Deer Memorial Lecture for the past 17 years with different universities across the country. And these have been delivered by well-renowned speakers such as one of our founding fathers, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Dudu, Minister Naledi Pandor, former public protector, advocate Tulima Donsela, and former president Tabombeki, just to name a few. Today's lecture will be delivered by Professor Mushan Gondo, who is a decorated social policy national strategy developer, discourse analysis scholar and practitioner. Former Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of North, now Limpopo, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Venda and a Harvard Andrew Mellon Fellow. He will engage on the topic COVID-19, an existential crisis, challenges for knowledge, political, economy, ethics and religion. Ladies and gentlemen, we present to you Professor Mosheng Gondo. Good morning. At this stage, I would like to invite. We have. I'd like to invite uh, Professor Ndose, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Zululand, to constitute the congregation. Over to you, Prof. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, by virtue of the powers vested in me as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Zululand, I hereby declare the memorial lecture in honor of Dr. Bayas Nodier, open. Thank you very much, Professor Masoha, for agreeing to direct today's uh, program. On behalf of the University of Zululand, I heartily welcome Dr. Frank Chikane, the chairperson of the Bayas Nodier and his entourage. I want to welcome Professor Mushan Kondo for agreeing to give this year's Bayas Nodier lecture. University members of council present, university management, members of convocation, alumni, members of staff and students present, distinguished guests, you are all welcomed. This lecture comes at a time when the university celebrates its 60 years of existence. During its existence, it has produced graduates who rose to occupy high profile positions in government, industries, and in private sector, and in society broadly. During this time, the university has given practical expression to its mission of producing competitive graduates that are, have contributed to the needs of the country the region and the world. Luminaries that have walked through the university, the university lecture halls include the likes of the current Chief Justice Mukweng Mukweng, the Deputy Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, the former Chief Justices Langa and Ngobo, and many and more other people. The current Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation, Dr. Blade Zimande is also an alumnus of the University of Zululand. Director of the program, I'm stating these facts to underscore the fact that the University of Zululand does not lack ambition. It is a university that has no intention of mimicking any other institution. It strives to be the best it can be in its pursuit of excellence. It rejects any apartheid-inspired notion of being second or third class. And again, in its pursuit of academic and research excellence, the university is guided by its motto of a university restructured for relevance. It is for that reason that it has agreed to partner with Kakiso Trust and many other organizations 
and institutions worldwide. Such partnerships are informed by the spirit of equality, commitment to contribute positively in the remaking of our world. This understanding and commitment of, to relevance is at the heart of this year's memorial lecture by Professor Ngondo, entitled COVID-19, an existential crisis, challenges for knowledge, political economy, ethics, and religion. At the same time, I would be remiss if I do not join all peace-loving people who have raised concern about the continuing attacks of black people. We are repulsed by the recent broad daylight gruesome killing of an African-American male, George Floyd, in the same way that we were repulsed by the killing of an unarmed youth of our country under apartheid. We are saddened by the killing of Collins Cosa by our very own law enforcement agencies in Alexander. The loss of any human being diminishes us. In so doing, I'm in solidarity with, with those who say, I quote, as people of the world, we grieve the senseless loss of another life at the hands of the US police, close quote. We stand in community with everyone who is hurting. These brutal killings must end. Each is a wound to the heart of our humanity and the shame, shameful indelible mark of our great flag, said the Americans. Racism strives in the company of silence. So you will not stay quiet. In post-apartheid, racism thrives in uncertainty. The problem we have is that racism is a problem that belongs to us and all of us. It is our fight, it is our struggle of today. During his lifetime, Dr. Bayes Nodier exemplified this spirit of saying no to abuse and violation of human rights. With those few words, I again heartily welcome all of you to this year's Bayes Memorial Lecture. I thank you. At the stage, um, I would request Dr. Chikani to make opening remarks on behalf of the Kariso Trust. Over to you, Reverend Doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director Professor Masuha, the Vice Chancellor Professor Mdose, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Professor Siepe, our guest of honor, Professor Nkondo. Uh, we are pleased uh, to have you. And our discussant and trustee of Kahiso Trust, uh, Dean Zo Nebutalu, the CEO of Kahiso Trust. Banco di Muize. Welcome to everyone to this 2020 chapter of the Bears Nodier Memorial Lecture Series in order of this extraordinary son of this land. The Cajiso Trust is one of the leading development agencies in the country, uh, which works towards the prosperous, peaceful, equitable development of this country and the society. We work to overcome poverty by developing implementable and replicable models that we use to solve the challenges that this country is facing. And so, as Kahiso Trust, we focus in the areas of education, socioeconomic development, uh, capacity building, and also in areas of investment and, and sustainable financial resources. Over the years, the leading figure uh, was a leading figure in this country. He spent most of his time after the 60s fighting the apartheid system. And because of that, he became part of the development and conceptualization 
of Kahiso Trust um, and its establishment. So he's one of the founding trustees of Kahiso Trust. We honor him because of his, the sacrifices he made in this country. Kahiso Trust has worked in the last 35 years in the development sphere. It has spent about 2 billion rents over that 35 years. And today we are focusing in various areas that uh, you could follow in our website in terms of the details uh, of our work. We really are pleased uh, that the University of Zululand has uh, decided to host us this year. We do this lecture of Bayas Nodia in, with various universities, and we have gone, gone over many universities of this country. We have had extraordinary speakers like Bayas Nodia, Bani Pichana, the Minister Pando, and various others who spoke every year. We do it with universities because we believe that it is important for the academia, the students, and so communities to engage with the issues that we are dealing with to eradicate poverty in this country. So I would like to thank the University of Zululand for hosting us this year. And we are pleased that Professor Nkondo agreed to be the lecturer for this year. We're looking forward to listening to him. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Chikani, for the opening remarks. Um, and now we are set to, to move on. And I'm going to ask Professor Siepe, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Institutional Support at the University of Zololand to introduce to us the keynote speaker. Over to you, Prof. Vice Chancellor, Professor Mutose, Dr. Frank Chikani, Chairperson of Kahu Trust, and your entourage, members of council who are online, members of the university management, students and staff, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you one of South Africa's foremost thinker and intellectual of our time. He is not the kind that is routinely paraded in uh, wide media spaces. His radical and penetrating intellect is as intimidating as it was under apartheid. Professor Ngondo, like Bears Nodier, is one of the, those individuals that defy all efforts aimed at pigeon holding them. Professor Ngondo can at times, especially for those who know him, become intellectually inscrutable and always academically and profoundly philosophical. And uh, in doing so, he is uh, the kind that unsettles. Like Bez Nodier, Professor Ngondo is been, was made by the times, but they also made the times. He is a product of his family as a product of his time. His family has given so much in both blood and sweat to this country. He embodies a liberatory spirit and the more prone to problem posing. A fellow who admires Professor Gondo once indicated to me that during the struggle against apartheid while they were in the military camps, he asked about 300 fellow combatants, how they end up, ended up in the camps. All of them pointed that the Professor Gondo was the culprit. It would seem that the, when he was a lecturer at the University of the North, he had the tendencies, a tendency of spicing his English lectures with a, a bit of politics. Some argue 
that it was more a bit of more politics and a bit of English. In doing so, Professor Ngondo made the, the pedagogical more political and the political more pedagogical. He has uh, always argued that the current crisis that we face in higher education is to be found not in the obvious, not so much in issues of uh, fees, not so much in issues of access, not so much in efforts of decolonization. This, he will argue, that they are important. But until we address the sector's main crisis, which is both intellectual and cultural, we will not be able to resolve our challenges. Professor Ngondo would argue, as he will today, that we live in a world that is best described as volatile, as uh, uncertain, as complex, and as ambiguous. In private discussions that I've had with him, he has always tried to say to me, I need to embrace ambiguity. And I've been trying to understand what he meant. And yesterday, when speaking to Professor Kapula, he helped and rescued me from my philosophical entanglement by saying, or invoking reality, and say, you need to understand that the nature and reality is to be understood in the duality of opposites. And that is, then I, when I ask him, what do you mean? He says, you need to understand that what defines what is, is also defined by what it is not. That the one can be both stationary and still be moving. And that the, the world, always tends to defy that. This is why when he said that I understood it in physics, that at least in physics all the time, when we had to grapple with the idea of uh, light. At the time we described light as Einstein did, that it's made of a particle, at times it is a wave. It took some other scientists to say, actually, these are two sides of the same coin. And then I understood what uh, Professor Ngondo meant by the need to embrace ambiguity. I find it easier to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that what you have here is a, a professor who not only as it has been indicated that he has, um, he, he has traversed the world, but the best way of understanding him is to go back to the fact that uh, these are the people like uh, Dr. Chikane who stood and said uh, no to abuse of human rights. And uh, Dr. Chikane will uh, best know that it was during their time at the University of North that the Professor Nkondo came up with the book um, that he edited, The Tefu Testimony, which talks about the dilemma of a black university in South Africa. And unfortunately, the issue of dilemma uh, still haunts us as we talk about the dilemma of being a black intellectual in South Africa today. Without much ado, Ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the man of the moment, the man who has uh, tried to suggest that it is important that in the time of ambiguity, in the time of uncertainty, we need to understand that uh, pol polarity may not necessarily be the answer. Professor Ngondo, the stage is yours. And the University Vice of Chancellor of the Vanda. University of Vanda and a Harvard Caucus Andrew Trust Mellon Fellow. With its he will engage us as patrons and trustees. Is part of the new national symbolic system, which our government has established to legislate new values and new meanings. University of Zululand brings into sharp focus the complex interplay of knowledge and politics in our country, reaching back through June 16, 1976, to the defiance campaign in the 50s. Both these institutions are introducing a new linguistic and political space within which we should discipline our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions. 
they provide a new leading space for us to review our history and to think through our future. I'll talk about this briefly later. A few days ago, I lost a nephew to COVID-19. So I want to dedicate this lecture to Barry and Kondo and all those in the world who have succumbed to COVID-19. This is not a lecture in the formal sense. I want to turn it into a kind of conversation. So I'll start off by raising a few questions that have guided my thinking on the issue of COVID-19, its politics, its economics, and its educational implications. The first question, colleagues and our students, let us ask ourselves, what does it mean to say that since the outbreak of the pandemic in China last November, we live in a world that needs mutual recognition and a wide fellow feeling to mobilize ourselves for global solidarity. That to me is the preceding question. The second question, what has happened to democracy? What has happened to the international state system for us to need urgently the global solidarity movement? Has there been a rupture in our democracy? Has there been a rupture in our liberalism? Has there been a rupture in the international state system for, uh, for us to go through this sense of agency, almost a sense of desperation. The third question, how can governments, society, professional organizations, and the general public work together, I want to emphasize that, sharing responsibilities, encouraging one another in the development and institutionalization of a global solidarity politics, a global solidarity economics, and a global solidarity institutional culture. What should you do beyond theory, beyond discourse, practically? The fourth question, colleagues, governments are searching for practical ways to nurture and sustain the policy objective. That will be a major contribution to the globalization of mutual recognition and a wide fellow field. How can we globalize fellow field? How can we globalize solidarity? Solidarity, as you know, is an idea, but it's at the same time a feeling, it is an attitude, and it's a form of action. For the first time in our politics and in our, in our education, we will find a way in which it would integrate those four major forces of behavior. The intelligence, the feeling, the attitude, 
and the action. Later I talk about the need to come up with a new cognitive, social, and ethical epistemology. Let's combine those two of that later. Fifth, in what ways, practically, can the global flow of capital be deployed such that it, it curbs the global flow of infection? The left in this country and elsewhere has done a lot of work tracing the dynamics of the global flow of capital. But perhaps for the first time in modern history, the global flow of capital might be called upon to promote the global flow of infections. It is that political economy that shapes my thinking and my questions. The sixth question is this question of social distance. The economy that we have inherited, the politics tend to create distances between us in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender, in terms of world, in terms of language. These distances between north and south, between east and west, between Europe and Africa, between men and women, between streets and gays, these distances are a function of an antagonism at the center of our economics. We say, you are one of us, you are not one of us. That is the general anatomy of human relations in the world. If you are one of us, you have a claim to a moral obligation. When you allocate resources or make appointments, being one of us decides the appointment. Now, what am I saying? Being African or being Chinese or being American in the face of COVID-19, they amount to very, very little. So we have been called upon to come up with a new platform, a new political platform in which what we call differences are no longer antagonistic, but complementary. So the next person is not a stumbling block, but an opening and an opportunity for new possibilities. I want, to, I want to go back to say, solidarity is an idea, but it's also a feeling, an attitude, and a form of action. That is the fundamental challenge in our politics and our education. I think it's important for, for me to I'll talk about it more carefully. Coming up in the classroom, in parliament, everywhere with that integrity with that integration is major why in modern times there is no there is no necessary connection between what one thinks and what one does no necessary connection between knowledge and behavior no necessary connection between values, desires, and interests. And this is what Bez Nodi tried to reconcile. How can we, in the face of COVID-19, so educate each other and so educate our children to integrate those four fundamental faculties in ourselves? I think it's important. The eighth question has to do with family. 
as you all know, thinking, feeling, attitude, action, all these are inaugurated in the family, on the laps of mothers and fathers. That's where there's an inauguration of consciousness. How we imagine ourselves in the world, how we imagine ourselves relating to those who are dear from us. Once that consciousness has been inaugurated within the family, it will take, it's difficult for the school, even for the church, to radically transform our disposition to the world. I'm saying that with this experience, family should be regarded as one of the agents of transformation, as a policy subsystem that the state should use. Feeling, attitude, and behavior are inaugurated in the family. But unfortunately, for very complex reasons, the family has not been taken seriously by the state as an agent of policy. And I'm suggesting that an inter-science must be established by universities to bring together the state and the family in a more dynamic sense than we have done so far. I think it's important that it, can, it may no longer be regarded as a, as, a, as a factor only in the private space. That has also to do with the language that we must use now to bring together people across differences, linguistic, cultural, religious differences. Just now, most of the communication about COVID-19 are in European languages, in English, French, in German. And yet, as Mandela said to us years ago, if you want to reach down to somebody's feelings, if you want to reach down to somebody's nerves, if you want to reach down to some, somebody's attitude, speak to her in her own language. So language is not just an instrument of ideas, but it's a mechanism for, for feeling and for attitude. So a new approach to knowledge should be established where thoughts, feelings, and ideas are aspects of each other. It's not unusual, as you know, colleagues, for somebody to stand on stage and say, the people, the people, I love my people. But when he steps off stage, he treats the people differently in racial, gender, ethnic, or even in sexual orientation. These are the categories that have shaped human relations over time, that have shaped also international politics over time. These are the categorical imperatives that Western philosophers ha have used to impose their own geography and their own ethics and their own religion on Africa and the rest of the world. I think it's important that I just say. In light of this, how can we so you know, uh, uh, manage science and technology in such a way that they do not deepen or widen the gulf between the, the, the wealthy, the powerful, the knowledge elite, and the people on the ground. So far, even now, in the face of COVID-19, Science and technology remain the instruments of power and wealth and knowledge, and leaving out the millions and the billions. But now we know 
that whether you are a professor or a beggar, whether you come from the suburb or the Mukuru, COVID-19 makes no differentiation. So I think it's an important matter for us to grapple with, you know, very, very carefully. It's difficult, but it was tried years ago in the 17th century in England, but it, it, it didn't, you know, go very far because the, the liberal economies took over and use the science and technology to, to, to advance selfish interests. And now in the fourth industrial revolution, in the face of COVID, I, let's find a way in which science and ethics, science and religion, science and anthropology, technology and language work together in an integrated curriculum. That is the new challenge across here. I think it's important for me to raise that question. That brings again the sharp focus, the question of language. Whose language are we using to build the, gold, the global solidarity movement? Whose language and whose interests and whose values does this language serve? That's another, you know, uh, big question. So far, language has been used to impose certain values, certain patterns of thinking, certain ways of resolving conflict. And so far, English, French and German in particular have been used. As we all know, each language has its own political geography. If you look at the Oxford Dictionary, every meaning of every word there reflects British history and British interests. So what we know now about Africa is really a reflection of British meanings attached to our experience. This is what Edward Said said in Orientalism, that what we know about the Arab world and about Asia reflected in English is really an articulation and a projection of Western career. Africa, and the Arab world have become a career for the West. But that is so, so, is so, is so legitimized by the authority of English, the authority of French, which means in the COVID-19 crisis, we should examine the puzzle of using African languages as languages of science and technology. We can associate them only with superstition, with primitive tradition. There's a potential there for, for, you know, for bringing out the best that has been thought and felt in Africa. I think it's important that where do we begin with the new politics? Where do we begin with the new epistemology? We begin in the family. I think it's important for me to do that. Then the, the, the next question, I want to go back to the whole question of categorical thinking and how we can overcome that. When you come across somebody in this country, you ask yourself, instead of saying, who is this person? You say, is this person black or white? Is this person Zulu or Zonga? Is she Venda or Tswana? Is he Jewish or Chinese? These are the categorical imperatives that shape human relations in South Africa and the world. They shape even international politics. 
and they are deeply embedded in our consciousness, deeply embedded in our languages. And if you want to establish a framework for COVID-19, a framework for global solidarity, the matter of language becomes very, very critical. So the way forward is to come up with a politics which focuses on encounters with individuals, not groups. In the encounter with a person next to you. And that movement from categorical education, categorical politics, to existential encounters with the next person, there's where the major shift should take place. How do you come to know the next person? Which questions should you raise about the next person? These are saying, where do you come from? Are you from Lesotho? Are you from Zimbabwe? Where are you from? Are you from New York? You are saying, how human is the next person? So many people have died of, 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 of COVID-19. Americans, Italians, Spanish, Chinese, Africans. This existential trauma acknowledges no differentiation. You can't say, I think, therefore I am. That cognitive disposition is now rendered irrelevant. It is, can you die from this trauma? Can you do ABC? And we all have just found out that we share a global vulnerability, which means we share a global humanity. And this is the insight that we must carry throughout in our various occupations, in our disciplines, in the way we relate to each other. Back to the movement from categorical behavior to the encounter with the next person. And it brings out the question of names and naming. Nobody is born American. Nobody is born African. Nobody is born Chinese. These, cate these categories are not found in nature. They are imposed by civilizations around the world. I want to underscore that. These categorical imperatives that we have come to you know, imbibe as natural, as fundamental, as essential, if you look at them very carefully, they have their own political geography. They have their own political economy. They are there to articulate and reflect certain values, certain interests, usually in the interest of power. It's important for us to underline this, that the next person in front of you is not Chinese or Zulu. It's not Tonga or, 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 or American. This person in front of you is an immense possibility for immense interactions. These categories are historical, they are contingent, and should not be regarded as fundamentally antagonistic. I think it's an important matter for me to, 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 to. And then where do we, I raise this question. As, a, as part of a deliberative framework so that we organize our thinking or research going forward around that. Let me end these question, questions with the going back to gender. Why is history, why is economics, why is politics, 
regarded as a male experience. There's been a lot of literature in South Africa by feminists in armed struggle who say, why is it that even in armed struggle, armed struggle is regarded as a male experience? We must deal with this. The violence we see against women has to do with a fundamental assumption that the female is antagonistically different, that her humanity must only be defined in terms of the humanity of man. It's extremely important that as we draw the strategy for global solidarity, we raise the feminist question in a very, very profound manner. The woman that you are raping or beating up is a human being beyond your wildest imaginings. Treat her as a creation to be understood. And, then, and don't take for granted that your cultural, social definitions of a being is final. It's an important matter that. You come to find out, if you take the, the encounter approach, you make it possible to raise. If you, if you meet two women, one poor, one wealthy, one American, one Chinese, who is the best question to ask? to open up possibilities of fellow feeling across difference. So I'm suggesting that you know, as we do research, as we teach, we should try the encounter method, which is the, the, the encounter in real life, in real space, in real interaction. I move away from Deka, I think, therefore I am, and so on and so on, and say, this, this creation in front of me, how can we, how can I know her? What does it take to know this person in front of me? What is the meaning of this thing you call gender? What is, what is this value? How did it shape human relations the world over? This is a deliberative approach that I want to suggest. Then we have other resources. I'm happy that uh, Dr. Reverend Chikani is here. There are resources in religion that you can use. The question to be asked is, in what ways do our major religious traditions wrestle with the questions of difference? I'm talking of Christianity, I'm talking of Islam, of Judaism, I'm talking of uh, Buddhism, I'm talking of Confucius, I'm talking of Ubuntu. How do they help the global solidarity movement to wrestle, I mean to wrestle with a question of difference, with a question of solidarity? That's an important question. Closely linked to that, how do the major secular traditions wrestle with this same question of identity and otherness? I'm talking of liberalism, so socialism, nationalism, authenticity, negligence, back to basics return to roots, how do they tackle the question of difference and the question of global solidarity? How have we tackled these problems since 1994? We have been wrestling with the challenge of social cohesion 
and a problem. There's been no study in this country that has been able to measure exactly the progress we have made in terms of solar cohesion. But it remains a problem. There is still rampant racism. And now there's the emergence of ethnic nationalism. And there is gender violence. So we may not be as prepared as we think we are in contributing to the movement for global solidarity because we, we still haven't dealt effectively with the question of stock question. But where do we begin? And how can the church assist us in overcoming this fundamental disposition to the world and how we relate? to the next person. We have in the world things like the chosen people, the elected of God, the great unwashed. We have, we have in the world categories like modern, traditional, backward, advanced, developed, underdeveloped. These are fundamental categories that have shaped the way we imagine ourselves in the world, the way we relate to each other. And these shape our politics, shape our diplomacy, complicate the international state system. It's important for us to grapple with this question. Fortunately, Nobody, no cooperation, no combination of cooperation can privatize COVID-19. No global networks of capital can commodify COVID-19. And that's why so many now you know, progressive economists are saying now, much more than before, the limits of capitalism are so graphic. The fundamental structural crisis that Karl Marx talked about in, in the 19th century now is becoming more graphic and more dramatic. Liberalism and capitalism cannot deal with the fundamental contradictions of COVID-19. We, 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 we must look elsewhere for solutions. It's important that, um, that, uh, that. We've been talking about the global flow of capital. This is a language found in most books now, the global flow of capital. It undermines the power of states. It undermines the sovereignty of the people. But now, how can we use the global flow of capital to promote the global flow of fellow feeling, the global flow of solidarity? Is there something within our economies, is there something within our ethical system that we can use to mediate the tensions between ourselves and others, to bring about a whole scripture of global solidarity into politics. We have been, have been communicating in English and most of us you know, resort to writing. But we now know that most of our people, particularly the youth, spend most of the time in the audiovisual space. More and more people don't read. More and more people don't write. 
And yet, the, 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 and yet most of the things about COVID-19 are found in writing and very little in speech. Now, how in South Africa can we make use of the audiovisual capacities that we have to communicate more broadly on the ground? Is an important question, the audiovisual media. How can we do that? I'm saying this particularly to universities here that um, our classroom work remains logocentric. Writing and reading are privileged much more than speaking and listening. Because what we have been learning, the logocentric epistemology that comes from us to us from the enlightenment. But Africa is still essentially an, or, an oral space. So something must be done as we talk about COVID-19, talk about global solidarity, to find more space for the oral capacities that we have. How can that be done? How can we, in our education, pay as much attention to writing as we should, as we, to, I mean, to speech, as we do to writing? How can we you know, assess for listening and not just for reading and writing? We must move into, into that space because Africa is not logocentric yet. And also what is more is that the alphabet that we use is not native to African languages. And that's why there is a distortion in the sound system of English in Africa. That's why we have called African English which is significantly different from English, English. This distortion, unless we attend to it, will become a problem when we build uh, the movement for solidarity. People think of solidarity in terms of government, uh, government, how governments and In terms of governments, but in terms of people to people. At that level, in BRICS, for instance, how do Africans on the ground and Chinese on the ground communicate with each other? Not just the, the politicians and the experts. And what I was saying that COVID-19, because it's existential and fundamental, brings back to us the importance of forms of communication. Africa is an oral continent. And that orality must be acknowledged, must be acknowledged in our strategies. I said earlier that as, as, as a country, as we prepare ourselves to participate in the, in the global solidarity movement, we should assess how, how far we have gone in terms of social cohesion. If you look at our, the government's 10-year 10 10 year review, 15-year review, the 20-year review, they are all very tentative in the assessment of the progress made in our social relations. They are very, and nowhere, could I find a reliable social cohesion index? No social scientist has come back to us with a reliable, a convenient social relations, social cohesion index. A way of saying 
that unless we assess our capacity for soil cohesion now, it will be difficult for us to assess our capability to contribute to global solidarity. That is uh, something that, uh, that, uh, that is urgent. It's very, very difficult, in fact, to do that. Because it's difficult, and this is not only peculiar, it's worldwide. It is difficult to assess happiness. It's difficult to assess well-being, very, very complicated. The index, the traits are unstable and very, very fluid. But we need to, have a, to, to convince ourselves that we, co we, can, we can contribute out of our own experience to building a global solidarity movement. I think it's important for us to, to do that. I want to end up with where I began. The liberalism that the world works within is driven by market motives. And market motives embed in us categorical thinking and categorical feeling. That is a problem. And we have to find a way in which we can collapse that to say that what should, what should matter more now is not how, how wealthy you are or how, how, how knowledgeable you are. It's not that. It's that the next person in front of you is fundamentally human. And that humanity cannot be qualified by any contingency. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nkondo. Um, even though we started with some glitches, but uh, I'm very happy that we were able to overcome that. I, before I open uh, and ask uh, Reverend, uh, the former Dean uh, Nebutalu to respond, I would like to announce that this lecture is live on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. So you, you can catch up with that, go into those three platforms. And I, I'm, I'm actually not um, assigned to, to respond, but I, 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 I felt moved by the, the lecture um, presented by Professor Ngondo, very comprehensive, which covered all, all areas. And thank you very much for that, Professor Ngondo. I'm now going to ask uh, Murudi Nebutalu, Dean Nebutalu, to respond. And we will take questions if there are questions. Please uh, make use of the um, chat platform and then we'll record your comments and inputs to make sure that you are part and parcel of this um, uh, important uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Over to you, Bafunze uh, Vo Nebutalu. If you can unmute, um, unmute, but for the cover, unmute. Uh, thank you very much, and a very good morning to you, my brother Masuha, and uh, greetings to uh, the Professor Mdose, the Vice Chancellor, and to our chairperson, Dr. Chikane. For the rest, I will resort to protocol observed. Um, and thank you very much to Professor Nkondo, Akeza, Osi, and our condolences to you and the family for having shared your pain of the loss of your loved ones. And indeed, 
from the platform of this webinar, we send condolences to um, other families who have lost loved ones during this time. Um, let me now come to a very brief response of the a wonderful topic that was presented by Professor Nkondo. I cannot think of a more contextual and current topic. COVID-19 has indeed, um, it has indeed created an existential crisis. There is a sense in which we could say that no one saw it coming. It has opened the fracture lines of challenges already faced in this country, Africa and the globe. Black Lives Matter, femicide cases, and an economy that is uh, highly unequal and is plummeting. All these make us rethink our issues society, religion, education, and economics. It is indeed true that new thinking um, should definitely arise. Mapping of a new landscape in terms of society, religion, education, and economics. Professor Nkondo's presentation paves a new path in this particular regard. I think particularly, Professor Nkondo, of your comments on global solidarity and how coronavirus has impacted political, social, economics, uh, and ethical system, even more so your emphasis on the family. What is so singular about COVID-19 in its grip do the classical categories of race, gender, class, ethnicity, sexual orientation, civilization, truth, progress, development, and so on remain stable? Or are they disputed? Um, or are they disrupted? Raptured, rendered fluid, as deconstructionist, post-structuralist, anarchist, decolonization scholars, and feminists argue? Those questions asked and debated will leave us with much to think about. Your suggestion that sociolinguists should work with political economics to explore African languages as languages of science and technology, a space now dominated by English with its negative implications for society was indeed profound. With COVID-19 and the global solidarity movement, you spoke of the educational system becoming more transformative and, lecturer and lectures and that students, teachers and learners will be able to talk more freely about knowledge, language, power, freedom and, ju and justice. A new analytical vocabulary is required. We would like to thank you, Professor Nkondo, for your words and thought at this seminal time in our history. I also want to pay tribute to the late Dr. Beaz Nodi and his legacy, who was in many respects a great thinker, a theologian, one would even say a politician, but whose work actually cuts across all those categories that you have rightfully indicated are in most instances very artificially created. His work is still so relevant today and should be a light for all activists, young and old, new and experienced. Finally, Akensa Hosi, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it's on, it's on, okay. mm -hmm. Hello? Thank you. Th Hello? Th thank you, uh, Professor Nkondo. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, but that, yeah. Hello? Hello? Uh, Professor Nkondo? Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. I wanted to acknowledge the um, response by Reverend Nebutalu. Uh, thank you very much. 
I have not actually received any question coming from the audience. I, I, I take it that we can proceed. I, can we safely proceed? I think we can, in the absence of questions. I think we should. We should. Hello? From Professor Ngondo. Okay. Hello? Professor, yes. I, Professor Hello? Ngondo? Professor Ngondo? Yes. I, maybe you, you, you have got some, some closing yeah, remarks. I just, yeah, I just want to, to, to yes. just make one or two more remarks. Uh, Thank how, you. How Dr. Ben Nodi comes into this discourse. In 1976, in fact, 1974, uh, with the independence of Limo, quite a number of our student leaders mobilized celebrations in almost all of the historically black universities, including the University of Zululu. Okay. Uh, but they were charged those days with promoting terrorism. The University of the North, now University of Limpopo, set up a commission of inquiry chaired by Judge Snema, Dr. Reverend Chikane will remember that because he played, he played a very significant role as a, as a student witness in the commission of inquiry. The Black Academic Staff Association led by Chief Justice Ishmael Mohammed, presented you know, the, you know, a, 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 a comprehensive uh, testimony to the Sneeman Commission, which, which, out, out, which later was published by Raven Press in a book, as for Siepa said, Teflop Testimony, the dilemma of a black news of Africa. That book, published by Raven Press, was funded by Dr. Bess Nodin. That was in 1976. And it's very, 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 to me, it's a great pleasure that, uh, that uh, we are now honoring him. After the Sneeman Commission, people like, uh, you know, Seth Cooper, uh, late Strini, Strini, Strini Imudli, uh, the, uh, 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 Likota, they were accused, there were, there were six of them uh, charged under the act of terror, terrorism. They appeared before the Judge Boshoff here in Pretoria. Steve Biko was the first defense witness and defended what he called the underpin, the philosophical underpinnings of black consciousness. That testimony now appears in a book entitled The Testimony of Steve Beacon. A day after, I was asked as, as the second defense witness to defend black consciousness arts. So when, when, uh, when we see... Um, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Nkondo, for those remarks. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm picking up some few comments. I would like them to be collected. I saw one or two from uh, Dr. Shamase. But I felt I should also um, say some few words regarding how our generation um, got to know uh, Dr. Beas Nudie, because this takes me back to the late 80s when Dr. Beas Nudie worked with uh, Professor uh, Kisner. And I remember the work of the, um, the Institute for the Contextual Theology, which was led by Reverend Dr. Chikani, and that was the time when we started um, with critical thinking, and we've been raised as young scholars at the time. 
So I think this is very important. This is taking us back to that time of critical thinking, how we've been shaped to become thinkers at that particular time. And thank you very much for this opportunity. And also I was chatting a little bit with uh, Bo uh, Jin Nebutalo for the mentoring they gave, they gave to us. So can I get some of the few comments? Um, I thought you would write them. I saw one which is coming from um, Dr. Shamase. It's just one, uh, and I'm going to read it. Uh, COVID-19 has highlighted the intensity of our time, of our interconnectedness as human beings and societies, including the shared depth of our mutual vulnerability, one to the other. Dr. Beas Nudir would argue and say that this reality firmly underlines the absolute necessity of expressing and ramping up our practice of international solidarity among state and non-state actors alike if enjoyment of human rights across the world is to be optimized. I take this to be a comment. Yes, uh, it's a comment unless if um, Professor Ngondo wanted to say something. And then let me also acknowledge a comment that which is coming from Professor Kreilen. Um, Professor Ngondo's plea for global solidarity and new economic thinking to address the economic crimes of poverty and inequality can just be applauded in this time where there is more divergence between economies than ever before. These are two important comments and I think we will, we will, we will take them up. I remember the committee that was working on this wanted to take the work beyond this lecture in terms of research. We also spoke to Professor Mlitwa. So these are important comments. Right, I would like to close this. Um, maybe allow, um, I think uh, for, from here now, I'm going to ask Mayor Mamko Di Muitze uh, to uh, do the message of appreciation. I'm going to ask you, Mayor, to proceed. Over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Chairperson. Good morning, I, once again, I uh, would really like to take this opportunity as Gakiso Trust and the University of Zululand to thank everyone who has made time to join us in this occasion. I would also want, li like to take the opportunity to express our gratitude to our Board of Trustees who are with us here today for the work that you continue to do for the trust and also to ensure that Gakiso Trust has progressed and will continue to progress in doing the much needed work that is required in this country. Today, we have witnessed our first version of the Bias Nodier Memorial Lecture in a virtual form. And I think it's all testament to say times have really changed. We were thinking fondly about the late Dr. Bias Nodier. What would he have made of these times that we are facing? What we know is that we are really, really grateful for the legacy and the light he has left us. Hence today we have a place where we can converge and think deeply about what affects us as a community of South Africa, a community of Africa, and a community of the world. I want to take this, special, this time to say a special thank you to the Nodier family, who I know that they are here in this lecture. We thank you for continuing the support of what the Trust is doing and ensuring that every year when we continue with these lectures, you are present to support. Thank you so much to the Nodier family. We'll also want to take this opportunity to really thank a lot of people who are working or continue to work in the background. I've learned so much about putting this webinars in place. I've noticed it takes, takes a lot of work in the background. Would like to take an opportunity to thank the staff in the university and the staff at Gathers Trust to supporting and making sure that today really, really works. Last but not least, let me take this opportunity to thank the university to have such a willing partner in taking the conversation of our country forward, 
We really appreciate it. We are grateful to Professor Masoha. We are also grateful to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Siepe. We are really grateful for the work that you have put in. We are also very much grateful for Professor Nkondo for really gracing us in this occasion. And thank you so much for giving us food for thought and really engagement and conversation to think deeply as we proceed. Your words of wisdom are a really guiding light to help us to navigate during these terrible times. I'd like this opportunity to really thank you all and over to you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you very much for the um, message of appreciation. I have um, uh, noted two more comments, uh, which I think as the, the committee will look at that, uh, that was a promise. Uh, I think it's also important just to acknowledge one comes from uh, Ms. Makosi Ngomalo, the, who says the biggest and saddest thing that COVID-19 has revealed is inequalities, class and gender, inequalities being the main. And according to her, uh, is that the worst is yet to come as the economy attempts to adjust. Uh, that we are noting. And there's also another one, um, uh, the, the, an extra one from, professor, uh, from Dr. Shamase. Uh, professor Ngondo teaches us to learn from this pandemic pandemic, how to achieve a healthy balance between globalized and localized economies. Academic work must be globally connected, but in a sustainable way. And then there's also a, a, a question which I think, oh, no, no, this one is private. <laughs> yeah, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. Um, what advice do you give to new young activists today? I think let's, let's probably park it and then we'll take it up. And this actually takes me back to what the Vice Chancellor wants to do. She wants to have a book which actually narrates or collects all the stories about COVID-19. And I think Vice Chancellor, this becomes an important platform to, to proceed with what you had as a dream uh, be, be beyond the uh, Bayer's New Day lecture. I, I, I think we, we might have to go back to the uh, drawing board and and talk about some of these issues going forward. Um, uh, I think that will be taken up in this case. Colleagues, I think I, this has been a wonderful morning. Um, as as Memwe said, uh, that uh, we've got now food for thought we're, as an institution of learning, higher learning. And I think I, I was saying to the committee that we, we are so privileged that as an investor of Zululand, we had an opportunity of looking at the work of the life of um, Dr. Beas Nudier in the context of COVID-19 and to, to chart a way forward and say, what is it is required for us? As we are battling with all kinds of issues in terms of teaching and learning research in, in, in this situation, but we have an opportunity now to say we can move forward. And I think um, from the University of Zululand, I'm very grateful that we, we had an opportunity to converse and talk about this as, as a university and also talk with Kafiso Trust going forward. And we, want to, we don't want to have this conversation ending now. I think we'll take it forward. And I'm going to ask, um, request Professor Mtose, the principal and the vice, vice chancellor to, to dissolve the congregation. Over to you, Prof. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of the powers vested in me as the Vice Chancellor of the University of Zululand, I hereby declare the memorial lecture closed. <laughs>